This is CBC Here and Now. People come from around the world and pay top dollar to visit the natural beauty of Fogo Island. So wouldn't you think that this community could hold on to a couple family doctors? I'm Garrett Berry and I'll bring you that story coming up on Here and Now. May snow is good for sore eyes. There is a little bit more in the forecast, but also some spring-like temperatures for others. Driving, it has recently been a costly endeavor, especially for those commuting to work. That's coming up. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Peter Cowan. We start tonight with another sign of stress on the healthcare system. For the last few weeks, we've heard from communities about to lose their doctor. And tonight we're looking at the impact that's having on people in one part of central Newfoundland. For the first time in more than 200 years, Fogo Island will be without a permanent resident doctor. In a matter of weeks, the clinic's last doctor will be leaving. And some worry residents will be the next to follow. Here now is Garrett Barry has our top story tonight. The MV veteran is a fixture of life on Fogo Island. For the tourists, it's part of the magic. But for residents, it can be so much worse. I just wanted to stay in the car. I had drainage tubes hanging everywhere. I wasn't feeling good. I'd only had the surgery two days prior. And I begged them to let me stay in my car. And they, they weren't allowed to do it. The chemotherapy and double mastectomy were hard enough. I remember crying in the car. I did not want to get out of the car to go on the ferry. But that long, unpredictable round trip from Fogo to Gander, it was just too much. Last time, Sabrina Payne crossed and didn't go back. It took me a long time to make the decision because I really loved the place. But ultimately, um, my mental health was declining because it was, everything was a chore. The ferry is filled with medical travelers, but this summer it's set to get even busier as the last doctor leaves this local clinic in exodus for medical appointments awaits. And I try to schedule my appointments when the ferry is like not dangerous goods day on a day that she's doing a late trip because sometimes you can run into um, a late appointment. So, and it's not easy always to get appointments when you want them. And the question around here, who just won't bother to return? Most people are saying, well, I guess we're going to have to pull up and move. We're going to have to leave for Guam. Do you, do you think people are serious about that? I'm, I think a lot of people will have to. At this point, uh, I'm the only, uh, uh, I guess, the last line of uh, medical care. Brown just moved back to help take care of his aging grandfather. Over the winter, he spent six weeks inside the Fogo Hospital fighting an infection. Without a doctor, that stay can't happen. Come June, when we can't see, when we can't see the doctor, I, I honestly don't know what that's going to mean for a lot of older people, especially in the community that don't have support systems or family members in place. It's, uh, it's going to mean uh, a lot of. Um, a lot of sick people and, uh, and hopefully not uh, more deaths as a result. This is the site of the Old Cottage Hospital, a system set up by the British governments before Confederation. And even before that, physicians practiced in this community in the old doctor's houses. You'll have to go back hundreds of years before you'll find a time where Fogo Island did not have a permanent full-time doctor. Well, you go back to 1792 and you can have a doctor here, and now we're back into uh, 2022. We can't get a doctor. Doesn't make sense. Either. Doesn't make sense. Out of a hundred doctors, there must be two or three that would, would love to come here and you know live this kind of lifestyle. So that's the kind of attitude we're going to take towards it. It's true. Other communities in this province are in the same boat, but because of that ferry, residents here feel unique and uniquely vulnerable. Right. Without a doctor, if you have a heart attack, for example, and that can happen to anyone. So you're going to go to the hospital and there's a her in there and God bless Duarts or a nurse practitioner and God bless Duarts. Matter of fact, I have a nurse practitioner in our family, but that's not a medical doctor. You just can't call in and, and ask the doctor in Gander to, to stop the blood in someone on Fogo Island or, or you know, you know, it, it just it just won't work. For years now, Fogo has been a hot spot, but there are two versions of life on this island. A tourism favorite for the rich and famous who paid thousands to see this beauty for just a few nights and fly back home. But there's also those who stay 
and feel like they have to fight to get the services that they deserve. This is an up and coming spot and uh, unfortunately the residents are leaving as the tourists are coming. Garrett Ferry, CBC News on Fogo Island. Well, it's not just medical services that will be disrupted. Fogo's mayor says the ferry service will face constant disruptions as well every time there's a medical emergency, and he fears the worst. It's going to be pretty scary. People are going to die on the count of this on Fogo Island. No question. People are going to die. Well, if you've got no one at the hospital and you had a heart attack and the van goes down to Tilting, which is 35 kilometers on the ferry, got to go down and pick you up, take you to the ferry, Maybe call in the ferry crew in the middle of the night, yeah. an hour across the run, and an hour to get there. Yeah. People are going to die. Now, Mayor Shea and his council plan to launch their own recruitment plan to try to lure a couple of doctors to Fogo, and he will share his strategy along with suggestions he believes could help lighten the workload. That's in about 15 minutes on Here and Now. In other news, an elderly man has drowned in Greens Harbor. It happened at around 6.30 this morning. The 73-year-old man and a woman were launching a boat in Scotch's Pond to go fishing. And while the man was repositioning the boat, he started the engine, but he lost his balance and fell into the water. Police say the woman tried several times to help him back into the boat, but was not successful. Police say she got into the water, brought his body back to the shore, and then left the area to try to find help. Neither were wearing life jackets at the time. The office of the chief medical examiner has been called in to investigate. Well, that area of low pressure that we talked about pretty much all last week is still hanging around. It's offshore now, but we're still seeing some cloud cover from that. But we do have a nice big ridge of high pressure to the north. And that is uh, letting some of Labrador see some nice temperatures today as well as uh, some cloud free days as well. So there's a look at that area of low pressure spinning. Uh, now, as we head through the next couple of days, this warmer air that we're seeing uh, surging further north is going to head towards Labrador today. Six degrees in uh, Lab West, but tomorrow you're going to see even warmer temperatures and then some of that warm air is going to head towards the coast as well. Now, how much warm air are we talking? 10 degrees it looks like we should hit in Lab West. Unfortunately, it's a roller coaster ride. We'll head back down below zero as we get into Thursday, but the closer to the uh, northeast coast you go, temperatures really not moving too much this week. In fact, a little bit below seasonal. I'll have the full forecast coming up. Thanks, Ashley. There are numerous reports of rodents in the health sciences building in St. John's. And first, a warning to viewers who may be eating their supper. What we're about to show you is what those mice look like. So let's start. This is a video that was posted on Facebook and we have some photos that show mice in the bathrooms and the emergency room walls at the Health Sciences Center. They were sent in to CBC News. The health minister says it's a sign of spring and steps are being taken to address it. We have regular visitors of mice from, uh, from the uh, Kent Pond area in health and community services. Uh, it's a hazard of living in those areas. My understanding is both TI for Confederation Building and Eastern Health for uh, the healthcare facilities uh, have approaches to deal with that uh, using pest control methods that are fairly standardized. But this is the time of the year when the weather warms up where they come in from the cold. Now, progressive conservative MHA Chris Tibbs doesn't believe the problem is being taken seriously enough. These are supposed to be the most sanitary conditions in our province. How are we supposed to take care of patients with mice running across the floor? And I call on Eastern Health and I call on the health minister to do whatever they can to fix this problem immediately. This is a huge problem within our healthcare system right now to have mice running across the floor in what's supposed to be the most sanitary conditions in the province. It's not good enough. It's just another black eye on this government and what they should be doing. Well, staying with healthcare news, an update on COVID. One person in the province has died since Friday's COVID update. The person was above the age of 80. Eight more people are in hospital since Friday. That's up to 24 people now. Just three of those, though, are in the ICU. Well, starting today, people using the province's mental health crisis line should call 811. The Department of Health says the three-digit number is easy for residents to remember and call when needed. They said anyone who's in crisis or needs mental health and addiction support can call the line and speak with a registered nurse trained in crisis intervention. 
The health department says using 811 enhances their capacity to assist people in a crisis. All right, we're going to get to some other news now. Trial dates have been set for a lawyer accused of sexually assaulting a girl. The man's identity remains protected by a publication ban. He's accused of sexual touching and sexually assaulting a girl under the age of 14. This was back in 2002. Three other charges of sexual assault involve the same female, but are alleged to have happened in later years. The case was called in Supreme Court this morning, where he entered his not guilty pleas. A seven-day trial has been set for May of next year. Now the price of gas went up again over the weekend and it did it twice. The increase on Saturday was because of a spike in the cost of fuel, but the increase yesterday is thanks to taxes. The carbon tax increased, so that means gasoline went up 2.6 cents a liter. That makes a liter of self-serve on the Avalon now nearly $2.05 and in Western Labrador that becomes $2.11. Diesel also went up just over three cents yesterday. So with these rising prices that Peter's talking about, what do you do these days if you rely on your vehicle to get to and from work each day? Here now is Enrique Wilhelm spoke with some commuters about how they are dealing with these hefty increases. For many of the drivers on the province's highways, their car is a necessary means of transportation to get to work. I do commute between uh, Deer Lake and and Corner Brook, so it's not, I'm sure, as far as some other commutes in the island, but uh, I do travel, I guess, about 110 kilometers uh, a day. I live on Hodgewater Line, uh, Mackinson's area, and I commute in. So I do about 80 to 100 kilometers in and out. Commutes that have become more expensive over the past months. Last week alone, the province saw four PUB price adjustments. For most of the province, gas is over $2 per litre and diesel owners pay even more. I think I might be breaking some kind of record, but a couple weeks ago I did manage to squeeze uh, $103 into, into, a, into a Corolla. I filled up yesterday and I wasn't even on empty and I was close on 150 bucks. The prices caused some commuters to make big adjustments. In the coming weeks I'll be transitioning to a, uh, you know, a full-time job in Deer Lake. Uh, and the price of fuel, the price of uh, getting back and forth to work um, has certainly played a factor in that. Taylor has been staying with a friend in St. John's on weekdays since last summer and reduced her trips home to her husband to once or twice a week. We thought we were making a decision to do some extra things we want to do and be a bit smarter with our money. And of course the environment too. But uh, we now, turns out we just made that decision right in the nick of time because we are spending a lot of time apart just to kind of break even at this point. Both are seeing others make similar changes. My folks are a bit older on fixed income. You know, they're very conscious uh, over where they go. Is it essential? Is it not? Many more commuters might face tough choices should the gas price keep rising. The next adjustment by the PUB is scheduled for Thursday morning, but with the interrupter clause, a change could come any time. Henrike Wilhelm, CBC News, Mount Pearl. Well, in other news now, a local tech company is changing the way it does business and the way you learn to code. Yeah, and the idea is you don't pay for tuition until you get a job. My name is uh, Jan Mertli. I'm the CEO and, and co-founder of Get Coding. Uh, we offer something we're calling the coaching program, which uh, takes people from not knowing how to code to becoming a software developer in six to 12 months. Uh, what we're introducing now uh, is something we're calling deferred conditional tuition, in short DCT, it's you know, a cool short, short name for it. What it is, is um, a, a new uh, tuition payment agreement uh, that uh, allows students to pay uh, you know, a low monthly fee while they're in the program and only if they get a job, that's the conditional part, only if they get a job they pay the remainder of the tuition. We're so confident in uh, the effectiveness of the program that uh, you know, we're ultimately tying the success of the students to the success of Get Coding. So if students uh, coming out of Get Coding are not succeeding and not getting jobs, then get coding is not surviving. It's, it's open for anyone that wants to switch their career. Um, 
Most people that we've been seeing are, are people coming from the oil and gas sector. Uh, some of them have been laid off or are just sort of um, not interested in continuing that line of work and just want to change up um, uh, their career trajectory. Well, much of the Avalon had sunny, warm weather yesterday. Central Newfoundland got this snow. Nice, a nice bit of snow as well. We'll talk about that after the break. Another update is brought to you by the Healthcare Foundation Home Lottery. Early bird deadline is midnight, Friday, May 6th. Order tickets now at hcfhomelottery.ca. Ashley, I feel like this is the time of year where people develop amnesia. They think that they're living somewhere that gets a nice proper spring, mm -hmm. and then they get really disappointed when instead of spring, they get snow. That's right. Because it's not May 2-4 yet, 
we're still in snow season. <laughs> we have, I was actually just talking about that, how really there's only a few months where there's, you know, really no snow in the forecast. And May is not one of them. May is not one of them. But uh, yeah, we showed you a little bit of this footage earlier, but it was definitely snowy in uh, Gander. Yeah, enough that you had to scrape it off the car, although the good news is not enough that it really stuck around. Like, no. Once you got your car cleaned off, you were kind of good to go. That's also the good thing about May is the snow falls and then the sun angle so high that it even does make it through the clouds today a bit cloudy. But yeah, that snow did not last very long today at all. Oh, look, gardening supplies ready to go. <laughs> how perfect. <laughs> but yeah, let's how much snow actually fell. So 12 centimeters fell in Gander and that brought the total so far this year to 400.6 centimeters. Now still significantly less than Corner Brook where 537 centimeters has fallen, but not as much as Lanzalou. Still seeing all of that snow, uh, 569 centimeters of snow has fallen so far this season in Lanslou. So definitely uh, lots of snow still to melt out there uh, as we head you know, through the next couple of months. But that area of low pressure to the far east now, but we're still seeing lots of cloud cover with this system. Uh, right across the board, except up across Labrador, where a ridge of high pressure is sitting in place and actually a pretty nice day for you. But uh, we are starting to see a little bit of clearing. It looks like down through the southern areas of uh, the island. But other than that, we're going to stay pretty cloudy as we head through the night tonight. Temperatures today were not too bad. Uh, below seasonal, though, six degrees in St. John's. Marystown was the hot spot today at 12. Port of Bass sat around 9 degrees for a good chunk of the day. And then look up, uh, look at what's happening up across Labrador. 5 degrees in Happy Valley, Goose Bay today, 7 in Lab City. That is right around where you should be sitting this time of year. Much cooler as you head towards the coast again because of that onshore flow. So current conditions in St. John's right now. See a little bit of fog hanging around out there, uh, but uh, generally looking at that temperature around 4 degrees. Those winds out of the north at uh, 19 kilometers per hour, more like uh, gusting more like 28 kilometers per hour. So a bit of a wind chill feeling more like zero. Now those temperatures across the board have dropped just a little bit. Uh, still sitting beautifully at seven degrees for Lab City right now and uh, around zero degrees in Cartwright. Now, as we head through the night tonight, that temperature isn't really going to move a whole lot for you. But as you head towards uh, the west, Lab City will go down to about minus six tonight. That's because you should be you're under that ridge of high pressure. Those skies should clear tonight. That's going to allow those temperatures to drop but going to stay unsettled for a good chunk of the night tonight for the island with those temperatures between zero and plus two, plus three, uh, generally just looking at the chance of some drizzle. Now, Northern Peninsula, coastal areas of Labrador, you're still looking at that chance of a few flurries in the mix as well as some of that colder air mixes in and those winds will generally be out of the north. So current uh, satellite and radar, you can see not a whole lot showing up. A few showers or drizzle really just in that onshore flow. That's where most of that cloud cover will be. And the model's picking that up fairly well uh, and will continue to do so. Now that area of low pressure is going to eventually pull out. Not tonight though. Uh, so the areas of drizzle fog patches definitely still going to stick around. And as we head through tomorrow afternoon, some of the higher elevations and really most of central could see some flurries in the mix before changing back over to the potential for uh, some showers and or drizzle. Some areas, if your temperature's hovering around the zero degree mark, may even see some freezing drizzle associated with this one. But as the day goes on, looks like the Avalon southern areas of the island as well as the southwest should actually clear out and then a beautiful day for most of Labrador except the southeast where again, you'll hang on to some of that cloud cover through the afternoon and into the overnight hours as well. So temperatures tomorrow uh, should be pretty similar to what we're seeing today, around six degrees for St. John's. Out of, winds out of the northwest, 20 to 40 kilometers per hour at the most. Uh, Marystown should reach uh, about 10 degrees tomorrow under a mix of sun and cloud. And then again, that drizzle as you head towards further uh, towards the coast. 5 degrees in Gander, 11 in Harbor Breton with that sunshine. And then as we head towards the southwest, anywhere from 8 to 10 degrees through the day. Again, higher elevations, particularly Green Bay, White Bay and Long Range Mountains may see that uh, continue to linger as flurries uh, into the afternoon. And then for southeastern portions of Labrador, your temperatures should be above zero. But again, either showers or flurries through the afternoon. Nicest weather? Looks like it should be in Lab West tomorrow, even through central areas of Labrador and the north, anywhere from 6 to 
11 degrees will be your afternoon highs. Uh, not a whole lot of wind either, so that should help to melt some of that snow. So that's a look at the forecast. We'll look ahead when I come back. People flock to the beauty of Fogo Island, but why can't they find a doctor? In just a few weeks, Fogo is losing its permanent resident doctor. Its mayor believes too much pressure is being placed on too few workers, and they're going to plan to start a recruitment plan. Our Garrett Berry spoke with him. I tell you, it's going to be pretty scary. People are going to die on the count of this out for a while. No question. People are going to die. Well, if you've got no one at the hospital, and you had a heart attack, and the van goes down to Tilting, which is 35 kilometers on the ferry, got to go down and pick you up, take you to the ferry, maybe call in the ferry crew in the middle of the night, yeah. an hour across the run, and an hour to get in there. Yeah. People are going to die, but other things too. You, get, you know, like you got to get cared, it's, right, it's important. You see them advertising on TV, it tells you it's important if you're having a stroke, get this done right away. Yeah. But you can't get this done, and same thing down in Harbor Britain. Harbor Britain, I think, had the, the, the virtual one the weekend. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, they're three hour drive from yeah. they're three hour drive from Grand Falls. Yeah. It seems like there's an awful lot of nurses that graduates, but we don't have any. And I think the problem is is that they keep them on uh, part time. They don't get any benefits. So why are they gonna stay? Let's put the nurses on full time, give them a bit of benefit, and I don't think they'll have any trouble with nurses. Now the doctors is a different situation. But we got to have two doctors. One doctor is no good. You can't have a doctor come here for one doctor and he's working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you know, this is out of the question. So we need two. We really need two and a nurse practitioner. You know, Dr. Terry, like I'm, he's leaving and people ask you all the time why he's leaving. Well, that man has been working, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And last year when he went to go for his holidays, he couldn't get anyone to replace him. So he had to change all his schedules and everything and to get his, get his holidays, you know, and, and that's, that's a bit much, you know, and he got a young family. So I can understand wanting to leave. But if I think if we had got someone here earlier, had two doctors, he may not have left. I've been in contact with the mayor, Jane Johnson, and we're on the same page with this, you know. And uh, they only have one nurse over there. And, you know, that's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so she got to be off sometimes. And she told me that there was a lady from Jane Johnson's went in. She's in on the stretcher four days in the corridor. Waiting. Waiting. So I can't see how the service is going to get down here on Fogo Island because we're going to totally disrupt our ferry service yeah. and we're going to totally disrupt our medical service because we got some nurses leaving that, you know, we got a senior nurse that's leaving, we got two or three taking maternity leave yeah. and we got other people that's going to take leave and it seems like they're not being replaced. So I don't think we're doing a really good job recruiting myself. I, I think like a place like Fogo Island, you know, it's the place to come to town. You know, there must be, yeah. out of a hundred doctors, there must be two or three that would, would love to come here and, you know, live this kind of lifestyle. Yeah. So that's the kind of attitude we're going to take towards it. You know, we're going to advertise, advertise the island as long with the doctors. You know, we got houses built here because one of their problems was that they had no houses. But there's the doctors, there's two houses built up here because a lot of the doctors that came here uh, didn't like driving in the winter from the ones in Fogo because they're not used to snow, so there's, there's three residents there. And you know, so- next, next to the hospital. Next to the hospital. There's two houses, one got two apartments and one got, it's a full house. So, you know, stuff is here. And you know, uh, and I think if we, we put it out that way, I think if we advertise Fogo Island as what it is, get some nice shots and nice pictures, and yeah. I think we'll get doctors. I've been, uh practicing it in this concerto for about a couple months now. Like, I have never gotten tired. And a couple months is a long time, especially when you're only 11. <laughs> Meet the talented young Toronto pianist who's coming to perform with the Newfoundland Symphony Orchestra. That's just ahead.
Well, the Newfoundland Symphony Orchestra has a concert this Friday featuring the powerful and moving music of Gustav Holst, The Planets, absolutely great music. And equally impressive is a young man, and I mean young, Ryan Huang is 11 years old and he's coming here to perform a piano concerto and Ryan joins us now from Toronto. Hello there, Ryan. Hello, hello. Welcome to Here and Now. So you're going to be performing Mendelssohn's G minor concerto. I'm still working on chopsticks. Uh, what do you like about the piece of music that you're going to be playing here in St. John's? Um, well, first of all, it's it's very energetic. I think that matches my style a lot. Uh, I like really playful kind of music, especially the first third movement. Um, I've been I've been uh, practicing it this concerto for about oof, I would say a couple months now, like six months maybe, probably somewhere around that. And uh, and the like I have never gotten tired of it. And that's like usually when you practice a piece for six months or more, you start getting tired of it. Right. You know, like you start getting tired of it. But yeah. this song, I've never gotten tired of it. I have never, and I probably will perform it for the rest of my life. I just, I really like the first movement, that third movement are very playful. And then the second movement, it's, uh, it's very hard to explain. It's like virtuous with a tint of almost nostalgia, something okay. like that. It's right. like, it's, very, I like to like change, you know, it's yeah. like playing, it's doing three Broadway plays in a single night. <laughs> like, see, it, it masks. Yeah, see, Ryan, my, my nostalgia music goes back to playing Mary Had a Little Lamb on the recorder. So you and I have different sense of nostalgia. Listen, just take a, a moment, just take a moment now just to watch you do your thing. So let's just, let's just enjoy Ryan for just a, a few seconds here. How often do you practice? You mentioned six months for this piece. How often do you regularly practice a piano? I practice every day. Um, I practice around two to three hours a day, two to three hours a day. Sometimes when I have like a competition or a really important concert uh, coming up, such as this one, mm -hmm. uh, I play for longer, probably like five hours in really extreme scenarios where I have an empty day with nothing to do. I practice around eight hours. Wow. But that's really extreme. Right. So, so this must mean your marks in school are just absolutely dreadful, right? Uh, well, I, I don't, I don't have much time to do school homework. So I tend to finish it all at school, Okay. which honestly deprives the point of the name homework. Should work instead for me at least i have a question for you so you're only 11 i shouldn't say only 11 because you know you've achieved so much at the ripe old age of 11 but don't you have smaller hands than than most concert level pianists like how do you actually do what you do with 11 year old hands like your fingers you know uh okay many people say uh many people ask me that question uh and then i show them my hands i have you know, if you can see my hands right now. Yeah, I see them. Extremely large for, and for an 11 year old. Of course, some pieces I can't play. Right. But um, I'm not limited to that, to as much as most people think. Okay. Like I can like reach a ninth. That's pretty much enough to play most pieces on piano. All right, well, that's good to know. So um, I was gonna ask you what you do to prepare so you're not nervous, but I don't get the sense that you're the kind of guy that gets nervous about very much. I do get nervous. Okay. Honestly, I do get nervous. I just, when you get nervous, um, it will show. It will show if, if you're on the stage and if you're really nervous, it will show. Yeah. So I just, I calm myself down. Um, I tell myself it's like any other performance, right? It's like, you know, I calm myself down. And then when I get onto the stage and I bow, right? And I sit at the piano, it's honestly, all the nervousness is just, it's gone in the backstage. I left it behind on the backstage. There's no more nervousness on the stage. I'm just there to do what I want to do. 
no, there's no more nervousness. Right. Just one last question for you. Watching you play, uh, sometimes, e even though I've sort of made a little bit of fun about your age, you show emotions in your face that seem to me to be the emotions of someone who's much older than 11. And I wonder, what are you feeling? And why does your face show those feelings? That's an interesting question. I think I'm feeling whatever the music, wherever the music is going. You know, if it's a, if you see my, if you pay close attention to my face, whenever it's like a really playful music, you know, my face is very happy and mm -hmm. smiling and, and yeah, and excited. And when it's a sad, it's my face is more like, you know, it's very, I don't, it's kind of hard to describe. It's just more virtuous, I guess, Virtu virtuous. I, I, I'm not, I'm not very sure. It's like more sad, you know? Right. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I honestly, it's it's very hard to describe. Yeah, and I guess uh, you just do what happens. Just do what I, yeah. And and when I, and what if, and why it shows on my face, I guess, I guess that's probably because I do it unconsciously. You know, I feel so much that it just shows on my face, whether I like it or not. Right. Well, Some people actually complain that I show a bit too much. It's kind of hard to control it. Yeah, well, I think it actually adds to the performance, but that's my bias. Definitely last question. So you're an 11-year-old guy. Do you do anything else for fun, or are you just kind of, uh, you know, more or less chained to that piano, practicing to be as good as you are? Like, do you, do you go out and, like, skip rocks on ponds or get together your friends, go to a playground? Do you, you get naughty? Like, what, what do you do when you're not playing the piano? Okay, I am sometimes ask myself, how can I fit so much in a week? I play violin. I, I play the violin, I play the guitar, mm -hmm. I play, um, I, I sing as vocal class, the vocal class. Um, I play hockey, I play chess, I play baseball. Of course. So listen, I want to thank you so much for your time. I also want to sort of point out that I don't think, I can't think of any other 11 year old who's made me feel less adequate as an adult than you have in the course of this interview. So thank you for the humbling experience of meeting you on television. I really, really have enjoyed this interview and uh, I wish you all the best in your concert on Friday. I, uh, thank you for having me here. All right, all the best. Now, Starry Starry Night is the name of the NSO's concert this Friday. Ryan will play, uh, the Kalos Youth Choir is performing and then the NSO will blow the doors off with the uh, Holst. The Planets tickets range between $33 and $48, and you can just go to the Arts and Culture website to get your tickets. That's artsandculturecenter.com.
Police believe the man who killed 22 people in Nova Scotia smuggled three of the guns he used in the rampage in from Maine. Now, a CBC News investigation has found at least two U.S. residents could have violated federal laws south of the border by helping the shooter get his hands on them. As Elizabeth McMillan reports, charges may still be unlikely. It's only 550 kilometers to Maine from Gabriel Wartman's former home in Dartmouth about a five-hour drive. It's a trip he made often to the small town of Holton, just on the other side of the New Brunswick border. It's in this quiet neighborhood that Wartman had items he bought online delivered, things like motorcycle parts and the light bar for his mock RCMP cruiser. They were stored for safekeeping at the home of his close friend, Sean Conlog. He had keys to come and go as he pleased. Conlog declined to speak to CBC, but search warrant and public inquiry documents show he did two interviews with the FBI, one with the U.S. agency that investigates gun crime and another with the RCMP. Conlog told investigators the shooter took a Glock pistol from his home without his permission and that a few years before the killings, Conlog gave him another handgun, a 9mm semi-automatic as a sign of thanks to help with odd jobs. One weapon is restricted in Canada, the other prohibited. In the U.S., it's illegal for an American to sell or give a firearm to someone they know is a Canadian resident. But that doesn't mean the cases will end up in court. If it was someone who, uh, of a repeat nature, continued to give guns to people who then committed violent crime, um, then that might be someone you would consider. That would weigh the scales more toward prosecuting him. But if it was a one-off crime with someone where he had no knowledge that this kind of awful rampage would happen, that might weigh in favor of not charging it. The two guns that once belonged to Conlog were not the only ones the Nova Scotia shooter smuggled from Maine. He got another one from someone else. At least two people told police the shooter came to a gun show at this arena in the spring of 2019. An organizer says Canadians could attend, but they could not legally purchase a firearm from the authorized dealer set up inside. And any American who wanted to buy a gun had to pass an FBI background check first. The shooter did manage to get a hold of a high-powered Colt carbine rifle. It was described in court documents as a quick and dirty cash deal, a private sale. It's not clear exactly who sold it to him. I think the critical problem is, is the fact that Maine doesn't have universal background checks. Those private sales are able to go through without there being a background check in place. Um, and that is really a, a big failing in the state and something that many other states with stronger gun regimes have corrected. Pacino and Groban say straw purchases, where someone lies on forms and then passes a firearm to someone else, happen all too often. And there are not enough resources to prosecute them. Even if they just did a steady diet of these cases, they couldn't even make a dent. And that's not focusing on people who are using guns and committing violent crime in their communities. Back in Holton, a town councillor says gun violence is rare and it's unfortunate her community is now linked to the Nova Scotia tragedy. People want to blame somebody. They want to blame a, a place, an organization. Um, they want to say, oh, he brought arms over from Holton. Um, it's, it's a reputation that just isn't fair for a community that works really hard at <clears throat> enforcing laws. But the retired prosecutor says Maine is considered a sore state for guns, and she hopes U.S. authorities pay close attention to any recommendations stemming from the public inquiry in Nova Scotia. Elizabeth McMillan, CBC News, Holton, Maine. The sexual assault trial for Jacob Hoggard, the lead singer of Headley, began today in Toronto after several delays that were caused by the pandemic. The Canadian musician pleaded not guilty to sexual assault causing bodily harm and sexual interference during a preliminary hearing back in 2019. Hoggard was arrested and charged in 2018 for alleged incidents involving a woman and a teenager that police say took place in the Toronto area two years earlier. The complainants cannot be identified because of a publication ban and the trial is expected to run into next month.
Well, for a second day, long lineups stretched in front of the Montreal Canadiens Arena as fans paid their final respects to the legendary Guy Lafleur. I grew up with, the, with them. I grew up with those guys. They, they made us proud. The funeral is tomorrow, but for many, this was the last goodbye. Today's visitation ended this afternoon. The lineups were just as breathtaking yesterday. Beside Lafleur's casket were the NHL player trophies he'd won. And behind the trophy, he won five times with his teammates, the Stanley Cup. Tomorrow will be a national funeral, a Quebec honour that was also bestowed on Jean Beliveau and Maurice Richard. The pandemic travel restrictions eased dramatically in New Zealand today with people from more than 50 countries allowed to enter for the first time since 2020. Traditional Maori performers were part of Auckland Airport's welcome and there were many emotional reunions. Travel from Australia reopened three weeks ago. 90,000 flights have been booked since the moves were announced. Vaccination and testing are required. Travelers from China and India are still among those who are prohibited. Well, in what may be a rare coordination between two warring sides during nearly 10 weeks of fighting, efforts are underway to evacuate some civilians from a besieged Ukrainian steel mill in Mariupol, which is now mostly under Russian control. The UN and Red Cross are overseeing the complex operation after high-level negotiations between Russia and Ukraine. Ellen Morrow has the details from Kyiv. Civilians rescued from the Azovstal steel factory. After weeks sheltering underground, under bombardment, finally they can see the sun. These are some of the first people who escaped the factory. This woman was stuck inside with her baby for two months. About 100 civilians were evacuated from the plant on Sunday, a complicated effort led by the United Nations and the Red Cross. After many attempts, meetings and proposals, finally, says Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, there was not one day when we did not try to save our people. <laughs> Natalia Uzmanova was trapped in the factory since March. I can't believe it, she says. Now we won't have to use a bag as a toilet. We were scared. Still, as some escape, it's believed hundreds more remain trapped. The evacuation was paused last night after Ukrainian forces say the factory again was hit by Russian shelling. There was little sign the evacuation resumed today. People are under the rubble. This commander of the Azov regiment also holed up in the plant says we hear them talking. The evacuees from the factory are supposed to travel about 230 kilometers to Ukrainian-controlled Zaporizhia. That's where dozens who were able to finally flee from other parts of Mariupol arrived today. God forbid this happens to anyone else, this woman says. We will need lots of therapy. The children, too. Thousands remain in Mariupol, living in horrific conditions. But for those who've gotten out, now some desperately needed relief, fleeting though it may be, in this country under attack. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Kiev. Well, more than five and a half million people have now fled Ukraine since the Russian invasion began in February. Neighboring Poland has taken in the largest share, three million of those who crossed the border to seek safety. The UN estimates that more than 13 million people have been internally displaced by the Russian war. The White House announced today that Jill Biden will travel to Romania and Slovakia later this week. The U.S. First Lady plans to spend Mother's Day meeting with Ukrainian mothers and children who were forced to flee their country.
Well, Ashley, this is the time of year where I really wish I was back in Labrador because the yeah. weather there starts to get nice and the weather on the island tends not to be. So I, I got really excited. Double digit temperatures. Is that going to last very long for them? Yeah, not really. We're mm. actually going to, you know, after tomorrow, things are going to go on the decline for a little bit. But uh, yeah, enjoy the weather over the next day or so. Let's take a look at what's going to happen. Uh, so there's that ridge of high pressure. Well, it's there, but it's the lack of cloud cover that shows you that there's a ridge of high pressure there. Uh, but the next system moves in quickly as we head into Wednesday morning. So uh, we are looking at the chances of some showers for the first half of the day for Lab West and then some of that colder air as the cold front moves through will wrap in around it and actually it's going to change the potential for some snow and or fl well flurries really in the afternoon for you as those temperatures continue to drop. Now not a whole lot happening across the uh, island through the day on Wednesday. It does look just like it should stay cloudy, but those showers will work their way towards coastal areas of Labrador through the day. There's that drop I was talking about down to three degrees as the afternoon high uh, temperatures for the rest of Labrador, at least towards the coast will be between eight and seven and eight degrees and then temperatures across the island looking pretty nice as well between five to nine degrees, a little cooler for the northern peninsula, but generally looking at gray skies through the day. Now, as we head into Wednesday evening and uh, Thursday, this uh, area of low pressure to the north will bring the chance of some flurries again for northern coastal areas of Labrador, and then the showers will move in across the island. So Thursday does look like the the when all the wet weather will move in and it will stick around through a good chunk of the afternoon as well and temperatures aren't going to really move too much either so we're looking at between four to eight degrees again normally around this time of year we should be sitting around eight nine degrees so we're just a bit below there and then labrador again down to minus one for lab city with that periods of snow sticking around a few uh, showers and or flurries for central Labrador and towards the coast. You're looking at flurries through the day. So over the next couple of days, certainly into Saturday, uh, it is looking unsettled for St. John's and eastern Newfoundland. Saturday's temperature is going to dip uh, three degrees. It looks like overnight uh, down to minus one. So we could see some wet snow uh, with that one as well. Definitely going to keep an eye on that forecast. And then uh, same thing through central Newfoundland as we look at those overnight lows. Uh, both Friday and Saturday actually looking at that chance of some flurries in the mix. And then for Western Newfoundland, you're looking at a similar story. Temperatures a bit cooler for you, only hovering around four or five degrees through the day. Now for Eastern Labrador, after we get through that, uh, Saturday actually looking pretty lovely at this point, seven degrees in sunshine and Lab West, a similar forecast and six degrees through the day. Now, Saturday, Sunday was a beautiful day. Take a look at this one. Lovely spring afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that photo with us. And if you have any weather photos that you would like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Bit of wind. Yes. yes. Oh, that was Conception Bay. Sorry, yeah. I forgot to mention that. There you go. <laughs> you can see it in the background there, Bell Island. Very nice. Very nice. I guess the one good thing about having all of this kind of drearyish weather is it's good iceberg weather. It is. And lots of icebergs out yeah, there. Yeah, lots of people uh, going, especially in Central, going out to check out, uh, you know, all the beautiful icebergs that have kind of drifted in closer to shore along with that drizzly weather. Yeah, so. Triton has a beautiful iceberg right now. Seeing lots of photos of that one mm -hmm. is stunning. Yeah, yeah. So feel free if you've got a great iceberg photo. We love to see them here. Feel free to send it in. Love to uh, feature it here on the show. So Definitely. Yeah, send us your photos. <laughs> well, and that does it for us on Here and Now for tonight. Thanks so much for watching. See ya. Good night.